sound, sound is from it. Okay. Okay. Um, if, first off, I, what I would really like you to talk about is the climate of anti-Semitism during Foods. The, you know, sort of what, what did Jews, what, in a way, what was it like to be a Jew in the 30s, given the kind of climate that there was of anti-Semitism? During the period of the 30s, the Jewish community was primarily a second and third generation Jew. They came just before. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that good? No. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Start again. Uh, in the 30s, the American Jew was primarily a second and third generation Jew. He'd come, so to speak, just before the turn of the century and immediately after the turn of the century. He was here 30, 40, 50 years. He was not yet integrated. He was a separate foreign community in many respects. It was an insecure group. It had no established infrastructure. They weren't here long enough, except for a, an aspect of the community which was German, which had come in in the 50s and 60s, 1850, 1860s, and they were already integrated. And as a matter of fact, there was a problem of the German Jewish community trying to find a proper place of the other European Jewish emigrations to this country. So that you had a disorganized Jewish community except for its religious aspect. They were in synagogues, they were in temples, and in this respect, they had a communal life. But there was no such thing as a defense agency. It was when Hitler was just bubbling up in 1932, 33, 34, and there wasn't enough knowledge about the incipient Nazism in Austria and then in Germany to warn the American Jew, so to speak, that if he was to protect himself and perhaps try to protect his fellow religionists in Europe, that he ought to organize defense activity. It didn't exist. There was discrimination rampant in the United States against Jews in that period. Jews were not welcome in many fine communities, posh communities, the Bronxfields of America we used to talk about. In New York City, 20 miles away was a community that was Judenrein by local village law, by deeds that were used to buy and sell property, Jews simply could not purchase and could not belong. The only Jew that you might find in that mild square Bronxville community was a storekeeper. Jews did not go to the colleges of their choice or the professional schools of their choice. If a young man graduating from college wanted to become a physician, for example, he'd have to go to Scotland or perhaps Germany. Uh, not in the United States because there were quotas against Jews and they were severe enough to keep 85 to 90 percent of the young Jews who wanted to go into the professions out. So that you had discrimination in housing, you had it in education, and of course you had it in employment. You could look in vain in those years for a respectable percentage of Jews, or I should say with blacks too, uh, in insurance companies except for the sales force. In Harlem, they had a couple of black salesmen. In Lowell East Side of New York, they had a couple of Jewish salesmen, and so on. But don't get into the executive capacity because you couldn't find them. Same thing was true in banks. Same thing was true in the steel companies and much of the higher levels of the American establishment. Law offices were either Jewish law offices, and they were small and newcomers, or major non-Jewish offices, so that there were barriers that in the world in which I moved, where we concentrated on this all day long, we used to talk about the five o'clock shadow. What was the five o'clock shadow? We Jews and we blacks met the non-Jewish white community during the day in our businesses, whether we were school teachers or policemen or civil service workers or whatever. When we went home, we went home to our own ghettos, now, that didn't mean the ghetto was what it is today, a ramshackle, destroyed place that looks like a piece of Germany during the war. It meant that we went back to our own social lives. We went back to our own social lives because the barriers of discrimination impelled it. So that the obvious opportunity of the minorities to make a relationship with the non-Jew was missing. 
today in law offices. They're Christians and Jews and blacks and whites, and that's true in the banks and in all the other establishment agencies. It was a world then which is totally different and which was changed in the years to come after the end of World War II with the development of the Civil Rights Movement, where Jews and blacks and others who had performed their part in World War II said to the American community, look, the day of barring us is over. We have contributed, Buster, and we belong. Okay, now I want to go back to the thing about, about quotas. Were these quotas implicit? Were they explicit? I mean, how did... Uh, Easy. The quotas were explicit. If you wanted to buy an, a house in the country, in a suburb, you would not be surprised to see churches nearby, which was exotic language to say Jews are not wanted because if it's churches nearby, there are no synagogues nearby. In employment, they asked you in a questionnaire, as they did in the universities, to say your mother's and father's name and where they were born because the secret was out. If you were born in Savannah or you were born in Austria or your family was, the likelihood you were talking to a Jew or reading a questionnaire of a Jew or a black or if they came from the far west coast and their parents had strange names. You were examining the papers of a Japanese gentleman or lady. So that there was every device and the ads made it clear, for employment ads, housing ads. In the educational system, they didn't have to ask you. Their questionnaire, for example, asked for photograph besides your antecedents. And it called for an interview where it was easy to find out what you were. We did studies in those years, in the 30s, and we found that there were universities, great ones and wondrous ones, and I don't want to name them because it's 50, 60 years later, and I don't want to injure them. But there were universities who had a static percentage of Jews that went from a 6% to a big 6 and a quarter percent. Year after year, it never changed. And so with blacks, there was zero up to 2%, never different, you see. You could tell whether it was New York City, where there was a large number of Jews, or a Cleveland, where they were far lesser, that in New York there should be a higher percentage of Jews going into schools than in any of the other smaller communities, and there should be a relationship. But there was no relationship. It was zilch. It was zero, or a very minor number, and it remained static. They had their ways of keeping us out, the minorities. It was simple to put in a deed. You may not sell this property to anyone other than a Caucasian of the Christian faith. That wiped us all, we minorities, out. In the civil rights revolution that went on in the 60s and into the 70s, that way of life went by the boards. Um, when you talk, to, can you talk about sort of day to day in addition to the things we've talked about, is there, are there any other sort of day-to-day -day kinds of discrimination that Jews faced sure. in terms of where they could go or where they... Sure. If a Jew offended a non-Jew and he was a roughneck, uh, he would be called a Jew bastard or a kike or a maki, just as they call the black man who offended them a nigger or some other such word. It was endemic. You would even hear nice people use language like that because it never struck them that they were reflecting a kind of language that came out of a bigoted, bigoted, discriminatory relationship. You could tell it that way. It was easy enough to tell when you couldn't get a job because you were a Jew. It was simple enough to find out when a graduate of law school or college wanted to join the FBI, a great government agency where you couldn't find a Jew and you couldn't find a black. And it was not because the young Jewish college graduates or blacks who were qualified didn't want to go into the FBI. But I used the FBI because it was a symbol of the kind of discrimination that we faced in the American white establishment. I'd like to actually, when we talk, because we have a lot of other, uh, uh, cut for a second, okay, Chuck? We have a lot of people. Take two. Now, you mentioned uh, um, Jews had, had trouble getting into the banking trades, yet there was all this discussion about, there's this perception of, of uh, 
with a lot of anti-Semites about, about the international Jewish banking conspiracy. I mean, how does that, how do they, how does one, how, how does that compute? How can they say that? If there's really very few Jews in banking, how can they make this point? One of the myths about Jews being both bankers internationally and communists internationally is strange because the Jews were barred from banking. It didn't require the existence of perhaps one bank for the anti-Semites to decide that the Jews controlled banking. They were caught both ways. They were either communists or international bankers. It was part of the myth disseminated by the Nazi propaganda that the Jews, under a protocols of the elders of Zion, which was an international conspiracy created as long ago as the 19th century, in their effort to take over the world, would control banking and would control government. You control banking by taking over banks, government by establishing a, a society of socialism or communism, and these bigoted morons didn't know the difference, incidentally, between a socialist and a communist. But truth had no relationship to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a disease of the non-Jewish mind. It doesn't relate to reality. So that when one wonders why Jews who had no banking establishment of any meaning in the United States were blamed for controlling the banks, it was because the sick, diseased mind of the anti-Semite decided that if they're not working and there's a depression, the guys to blame are the bankers. And if you're an anti-Semite, you make the bankers Jewish. You could pick up, for example, an issue of Father Coughlin's social justice. Father Coughlin was a Catholic priest who was a renegade. The church was embarrassed by him. But you could read in his publication the numbers of Jews in government or in banks except that if you check the names, they sounded Jewish, but were not Jewish. So they created myth that way. You mentioned the Depression. How did the Depression, because that's our period, how did the Depression especially sort of fan the flames or, or fuel the anti-Semitism, anti anti-Semitic? Uh... In the 30s, there were two causes for the rise of anti-Semitism. The growth of Nazism in Germany with the movement of propaganda into this country. The Depression, which gave the average American the need to find out who was the fault for his not working, for his having to sell apples on the street. You had a Klan. You had a Black Legion movement, was a kind of Ku Klux Klan. You had fellas in this country who had German connections and were listening to what was coming out of Germany, out of Erfurt, which was the central focus of the disseminated anti-Semitism. And so it became a natural process to begin to blame the Jews for the depression, for the no jobs, for the problems that Hitler was creating in Europe. It was a movement that ins insinuated itself into the higher economic establishment, and so you had organizations that looked to Wall Street for its financing or to big business, Joe Camp's Constitutional Education League, Merwin K. Hart's Economic Council, National Economic Council, very fine, high-sounding names. They weren't. They were propagandists who were frightening Wall Street that the Jews would take over Wall Street or Washington and they better give them big bucks, while the Ku Klux Klan was frightening the fellow on the lower level and telling them that the Jews were creating communism and socialism and taking their jobs away. So you saw the growth of, as I recall it, we counted in the 30s uh, some several hundred uh, anti-Semitic organizations. There was one book that came out that frightened the lives out of us. To this day, we never troubled to try to document it. A man named Stone did a rather respectable study, and he said there were approximately 800 bigoted organizations in the United States which were targeting primarily on Jews, secondarily on the other minorities. It didn't, it didn't get that high in my judgment. But to say there were perhaps 200 anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic organizations in the United States is more likely accurate. There were 75 periodicals in those years which were blatantly anti-Semitic. 
whether it was a Klan publication or some other kind of nationalist house organ. What kinds of, what kinds of things would, like Father Coggin, what kinds of things would they say, like specifically? What sorts of accusations? Well, it began, excuse me. That's right. Oh, how did uh, the professional anti-Semites operate? And what did they say? First of all, they were networked. If there were 200 anti-Jewish organizations operating out in the United States, they didn't operate each of them in a vacuum. They found each other. Their literature was distributed. One infected the other. One caused a connection to the other so that if one anti-Semitic organization made up such a myth as this, that Arnold Foster of the Anti-Defamation League arranged to mock up a synagogue in order to prove that there was anti-Semitism, and I'm not making up a case, I'm reciting a fact. Within a year, 50% of the anti-Jewish publications recited as a fact that I did that, and I never caught up with it. And to this day, 60 years later, you will find anti-Jewish professional publications which are using their own research files, charging that the original leadership of the Anti-Defamation League precipitated this kind of anti-Semitism in order to raise funds. So that most of the anti-Semitism grew out of the need of the professionals to raise money. Gerald L. K. Smith, who traveled the South and probably had 5,000 members, had an annual income of a half million dollars. And brother, in the middle of a depression, an income of a half million dollars was a lot of bucks. He got him with his tent meetings, screaming at the top of his voice about how the hordes of Jews were coming out of the Soviet Union and taking over the United States. We were simply communists and nothing more. We were part of an international conspiracy. Uh, if they found a name Baruch or a Frankfurter or a Sam Roseman somewhere in government, whether it was in Washington or a state capital. That was the proof that the Jews had moved in and taken over. You had a fellow named Goldberg who came along in the, much later, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, who went to the United States Supreme Court. You should have seen the anti-Jewish publications in those years. There was the perfect evidence that the Jews controlled. Well, why don't you tell me now, let's go, now get to, um, uh, the Jewish community's reaction to this anti-Semitism, did they, uh, did they, they, they seem to have at the time been a kind of an ambivalence. Are my answers too long? Well, when you go, don't worry about it. Okay? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll catch uh, you uh, off. Uh, uh, don't worry about okay. signaling me, I okay. cut right, right off. Um, how did the Jewish communities and the organizations react to anti-Semitism? Did they, did they fight against it? Did they, we talked before in our last session about the ambivalence of the Jewish community. Can you talk about that? In light of the growing anti-Semitism in the 30s, it's interesting to know how the Jewish community responded. First of all, it was unprepared. Second of all, it was, as I indicated, largely immigrant. And it was a new phenomenon. They knew it in Europe. They didn't believe it when it happened in the United States. They had no way of life that would protect them from anti-Semitism. When it began to rise in the 30s, it frightened them. They looked around, they saw no means of self-protection. Uh, they became paralyzed with fear, some of them. The organizations that paid attention to it decided they'd better not shake the boat. There were problems coming from Europe now. Jews were a headache to Mr. Hitler. They didn't want to become headaches to their American, new American brothers. So you would find many Jews who would say, shh, don't let's talk about it. There is nothing you can do except precipitate it into the newspapers. And if you precipitate it into the newspapers, you're going to be spreading it. So let's be quiet, let's hide, let's pretend it didn't happen. Now that, of course, was not the total Jewish community, by no means. But it did mean that there was a large segment of the American Jewish community which thought safety and security was in a kind of silence. You mustn't forget in those years when this began to rise high, uh, the press of the United States had attitudes about whether or not it would serve to spread 
anti-Semitism to report about it. There's always been a theory among the sociologists that uh, if you report in the newspaper that there were tombstones turned down in a Jewish cemetery, the day after that happens, you'd find it happening in five other places. So there were newspapers that were concerned about spreading this kind of thing, and they wouldn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, That's me. That was I did that. Sorry. Okay, why don't you tell me that story, the story of uh, your first incident sort of in the street. With, uh, yeah, it's difficult to make it short, but I'm going to try to telescope it. If I do it okay. to telescope, I'll do it over for you. Okay. I was in a unique position to begin to worry about anti-Semitism coming from Europe before most of my uh, fellows my age. I was at St. John's University in the College of... Take it over again. Just take two on that, will you? Go ahead. We'll just keep rolling. I was in a special position to become worried about anti-Semitism in the 30s. I was at school, St. John's College, and I had a Lutheran professor who had come out of Germany. I recognize now he was unable to live there because he was recognizing uh, what was happening with the, neo the new Nazi movement then. And he dwelled on it constantly in school and alerted several of us to the problem. We took it home. Our folks didn't know what we were talking about. But we began to worry about what was happening there and hearing him tell us of some aspects of it in the United States. It had nothing to do with the course that he was teaching. But he'd left Germany in horror, and he couldn't talk about anything but that. And so we listened, and we learned, and we talked about it. Thus, when standing on a street corner, a group of us from school, uh, on a Sunday morning, were just loafing. There came up the street uh, a mob of about 25 men. I call them a mob because they were not orderly. They were chanting, they were roughnecking, they were having fun, and they were chanting, uh, up with the Germans, down with the Jews. Up with the Germans and down with the Jews. We were five or six uh, young students. We just didn't want to tolerate it. And so we decided to step out into the sidewalk and impede their progress, which of course, as you know, resulted in a fight. Well, you would think that uh, 25 or 30 of them would have mauled us around. It didn't happen. They were foolish enough to push us up against the wall so we had no one beside, uh, behind us. And uh, we did well for ourselves until the cops were there. And the cops listened to the whole thing. They thought nothing of it. It was juvenility. They chased all of us away. But I walked away with a torn shirt. A friend of mine walked away with a couple of black eyes. And we knew that what I had been hearing about and we, my classmates, had been talking about was very real. And that took me, precipitated me, into finding others who felt as I did, which ultimately took me to the Anti-Defamation League, which was an office of perhaps three people in New York City, today an office of perhaps 350. Can you tell me about the street corner, what you did as you went, as they... They, it's not going into all of the stuff that you involved, but just... I know what you want. As a result of uh, the attack on myself, I found a number of lawyers and some policemen and others who would be interested to be helpful in opposing this. We created a small organization. At that time, we were able to count perhaps 35 anti-Semitic street corner meetings a week in metropolitan New York. And we organized ourselves to attend the worst of them and understand what the law was and what our rights were and uh, precipitate arrests when we heard the speakers causing violence, inciting to riot, act causing physical activity, uh, and bringing them into the magistrate's court, or what we call the night court in those years. And as by then a young lawyer, I was the prosecutor because in the field courts of the magistrate's courts there were no assistant district attorneys. The complainants 
friend of who he was a lawyer handled the case. So I found myself in court four or five times a week at night prosecuting the anti-Semites who were staining the city with their anti-Jewish uh, speeches telling the audience that Jews were taught by their Bible to uh, kill little Christian girls to use their blood for ritual Passover purposes. That was the kind of garbage that they were pouring out at meetings all over New York City. And that was the kind of thing that kept me in the courts and involved me even deeper in the fight against anti-Semitism. Did you ever come to blows at any of these meetings? Did you ever go to any of those? I know you told me the first one, but did you ever go to any of these things? Did any violence actually break out? At many of these meetings, there was actual violence by bystanders. We did not participate in it. That was not our purpose. There would be Jewish war veterans who would attend the meetings because the same fellows showed up at the same street corners to spew the same poison week in and week out. The Jewish war veterans came, and the Jewish war veterans came looking for fight and frequently got it. That sometimes served my purpose, our purpose, which was to say we had the so-called essentials of a case. There was the language that precipitated violence, and there was the actual violence, which helped us establish disorderly conduct and incitement to riot. But our little group never indulged in that kind of tactic. What, um, you, you t tell me about the, when you went to, to the Bund meeting. Um, in February of 1939, when the, okay. In February 1939, the German-American Bund was girding its loins. It was finding German-Americans all over the country and others who believed in, Na in Nazi Germany and who wanted to be helpful to it. And as they built themselves larger and larger, Fritz Kuhn, the head of the German-American Bund, convened a rally at Madison Square Garden. I wanted to go to that rally. I wanted to know what was going on. I was not a newspaper reporter, and I did not have a police press credential. But I got a small-time magazine to give me a press card. And with that press card, I got in without any trouble to the Madison Square Garden. There were, I guess, 20,000 people there. There were over 1,000 brown shirts, uniform Nazis. There were swastika flags all over the place. And there were drums. And I moved down to the press section with my unofficial official press badge. Uh, the, the speakers that started the rally drew great applause for Hitler, for Mussolini, uh, for uh, Father Coughlin. Uh, Roosevelt won him terrible, won himself terrible booze there. At one point, some young man down near the front couldn't stand uh, the main speakers cussing out the Jews, Fritz Kuhn. He jumped up from his seat, and he went for the stage. At that point, some of the brown shirts came marching down to seize him and take him out. The police came in. They decided to see who the press people were. And they found yours truly. And I was not a genuine press person. And before I knew it, I was in the outside looking at the building. Great. Great. Can you cut for a second? Sure. It's a great story. Good. How are So when it became apparent early on, uh, or maybe it didn't become apparent, but when at least Germany was becoming a dangerous place for Jews, how did, how did the Jews, and the non-Jews too, but the Jews first, let's say, how did they react to, to what was going on? At the when the information began to come to America, the radio reports or newspaper reports that Nazism was bubbling in Germany. First of all, it wasn't good coverage. It wasn't solid coverage. It was not major coverage, unless there was a particular incident. The Jewish community slowly awakened to the problem that was developing in Europe and looked around to see what it had within its own community that could be helpful. You had a rabbinate. You had a Rabbi Wise, who was a very leading rabbi and involved with the World Jewish Congress so that he was receiving in the mail from a man named Rigna. Haven't used that name in 60 years. 
regular reports about what was happening in Austria and in Germany. And Rabbi Wise became the font, the central source of information to the, what was the organized Jewish community about what was happening in Europe, and he was alerting agencies. You had the American Jewish Congress, you had the American Jewish Committee, the B'nai B'rith, the Jewish Labor Committee, but they were not the agencies that they are today. They were social in purpose, they were cultural and ethical in purpose, they were interested in helping the then Jewish community become integrated. Their concern was not anti-Semitism until the information that began to come from the Regners in Europe of the World Jewish Congress made them come to their meetings and instead of talking about uh, social service, talk about anti-Semitism. The first general response, if I may make a generalization, was that uh, let's not get noisy about it. Let's not upset apple carts. Let's see exactly what this is about. And there was a process of trying to get information out of Germany. And the information that came in was regarded as implausible, unbelievable. So that you had a semi-organized Jewish community which simply didn't believe what they were hearing. That put them to sleep, so to speak, in some respect. And you only had a small infrastructure rooted, I say, to religion and Jewish activities. Over a period of years from 1934 to nine. Yeah. Got it. Take five. Okay. So, with the obviously the rise of Nazism, there were a lot more people trying to get out of Germany, trying to get out of Europe, trying to come to this country. And what was this country's response to that? What was As the Jews of Germany began to want to flee, the first place they selected, of course was the United States. It was heaven. It was a place where streets were paved with gold. But what they didn't know that was that in the Congress of the United States, there was a fellow called Pat McCarran, a senator, who didn't want foreigners in this country. In the 30s. You know, the, qu the question is, is that is the needs for German, for, for Jews, to get out of Europe, and to get out of, became greater. What was, what was the response of this country, of this government, in terms of the barriers that were put up for refugees? In the 30s, there was establishment discrimination, which meant that the institutions of discrimination, so to speak, controlled the manner of life. So that when Jews began to want to get out of Europe, they found they were confronting barriers against immigration to the United States. In the face of a Congress filled with anti-Semites such as Rankin, Nye, Wheeler, uh, Bilbo, and a dozen others, they immediately began to try to create additional quotas against the infiltration legal infiltration of Jews from Europe. It set me off. Okay. Let's, uh, let's... Um, In the Congress of the United States, as a result, you had the beginning of an opposition to allowing Jews come into this country. And this caused all kinds of problems within the American Jewish community, a large part of which was interested in bringing its own relatives over from Germany who had begun to worry that that was not a place for them to be. The more they tried to come in, the more the endemic anti-Semitism rose up to try to keep them out, as a result of which you had all kinds of efforts that were clashing and costing the Jew the opportunity to come to the land of the free. They just couldn't get here in the numbers they felt they needed to come to get away from what was happening. Uh, the Congress was unha not helpful. Uh, Roosevelt, I don't remember uh, that he did much more than extend some visas for uh, Jews who were here on temporary visas. 
the organized Jewish community in the middle 30s worrying about this problem appealed to the Congress and to the White House to give emergency visas to those Jews who wanted to get out because of what was bubbling there, and Roosevelt did not grant it. Uh, so that Jews couldn't get in by temporary visa, Jews couldn't get in by immigration visas, and Jews were kept out. The worst situation was the story of the St. Louis, a ship that I think was a Dutch Holland uh, flag, took approximately a thousand Jewish refugees from the coastline of Europe to bring them to the United States, particularly to Puerto Rico and to Cuba. They came to our coastline, they sailed down to those two nations, and they could not get in. They sailed back up along the United States while efforts were made to persuade the American government to let them dock somewhere and get off this boat and escape the problem of Europe. They traveled for weeks and weeks and weeks up and down the Atlantic Ocean along the American coast. There were a thousand passengers, at least 250 Jews, and they ultimately went back to Europe, and ultimately most of them into the gas chambers, because this country wouldn't let them in. Well, why wouldn't they let them in? I mean, it was clear this was a, the St. Louis was a life and death situation. Why wouldn't they let them in? Because in those years, a survey would show that 50% or more of the American people were perfectly willing to indulge, and I'm explicitly citing a survey, perfectly willing to indulge in a campaign to keep Jews out of the United States. More than 55% of them believed that Jews had too much power in the United States. More than 50% of them believed that Jews were the reasons for our depression in those years. The surveys that revealed anti-Semitism, surveys done by the Denver Institute, by the Gallup, by the Roper Poles, all fine, established American non-Jewish institutions were producing shocking results about the attitude of America not wanting immigrants, Jewish immigrants, to come into this country. So that's what you were up against. You were up against the impact of an established institution of discrimination as an integral part of American life. What did it take to get a relative into this country? What did you have to do? What sort of... What well, sort of when, when originally they began to open up some of the doors and let some in, the Congress that opposed it insisted that these people would become public charges. So the first thing they wrote into the law was that no one could come here unless he could prove he had assets to bring in with him, or assets here, or someone who would support him if indeed he was not able to support himself and wouldn't become a public charity. The result was the informed Jewish community prepared affidavits. I was a young man in my 20s. And I must tell you, I executed enough affidavits if the people who came in as a result would have kept me in bankruptcy for 35 years. Happily, those who came in made their way, found jobs at low levels, menial jobs, but they supported themselves. And in the probably 15 or 16 affidavits that I signed, not one of them was ever called. So that the Jews who were involved in trying to help did everything they could to f make possible the arrival of Jews despite the resistance. What about, were, was the, but there were those who were uh, reluctant to offer that assistance? Jews, I mean? Were there some? Who were there were Jews who either could not afford it, Jews who were afraid that it would cost too much, uh, and other Jews who were not involved. You see, you must not forget that there was no serious credence given to the uh, situation that the Jews confronted in Germany. It was just not believed until the early 40s when the evidence of Hitler's final solution came to the United States with documentation. When first we Jews brought it to the White House, the State Department refused to release the study we showed of what they were doing to Jews in Europe until it was verified. It took three months before the State Department would agree that the information we had given to it was accurate and genuine. By that time, half a million Jews were murdered in the, dun in the ovens of Germany. This was the kind of situation we confronted. What about, um, F now, 
you said that FDRs didn't do much for Jews. And again, let's try to stay to the 30s, but nevertheless, Jews loved FDR. Yes. Why did Jews love FDR? What was it about FDR that, that despite all this stuff that they were In that period of time, Many Jews, even those who hadn't risen very high economically, found themselves part of the Republican Party until Roosevelt came along and offered to resolve the Depression problems with legislation that would aid people to live. He also talked about the four freedoms. And when you talk about freedoms then and now, you're talking to Jews, to blacks, and to minorities. You're saying to them, I'm for you, brother, and I'm going to help you get equality. So that that four freedom concept that Roosevelt believed in and tried to disseminate attracted Jews, and they believed in him. Then the war came along, and he was arguing for the United States to be an ally of France and England who were fighting the Nazis. And if the President of the United States was offering the great power of our country to help the Allies against the enemy Hitler, the Jews would again be attracted to him, as a result of which they moved generally out of the Republican ranks and into the Democratic ranks, and they believed him. And they cried many, many deep tears when he died. The truth is, if you examine the record carefully, you will find that Mr. Roosevelt, in my judgment, because of his reluctance to fight the Congress of the United States, the House and the Senate, did not do what he might have been able to do were he willing to confront them, as a result of which there was a failure of even the White House to do what should have been done for the Jewish refugees. Down for Cuba, and it ended up off our coast. You want me to start at the top of the story, though? Yeah. Okay. Okay, anytime. Yep. Okay. In the spring of 1939, the, uh, out of Hamburg came a German ship carrying approximately a thousand passengers, among which were 250 children. They were destined for Cuba. I think the International Jewish Rescue Committee had financed uh, the trip to that country. When they got there, after sailing along the American Atlantic Ocean coast, they found that Cuba was not ready to receive them. And at the end of two weeks of dallying in that area, they started back up to find some other port of entry. They never made it. They never made it because the attitude in the Congress was unhealthy. They didn't want more Jews, though there were less than a thousand. The attitude in the White House was that they could do nothing about it in face of the existing high barriers in the immigration requirements. At the end of several weeks, that ship with a thousand Jews and that many children was forced in desperation to return to Europe and to Germany. And the evidence indicates that most of them went to the ovens and the concentration camps of not Hitler's Nazi community. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I want to switch gears all together and ask if you remember the boxer Joe Lewis. From the sure. Place. What do you remember about him? What, what, why, why do you think he was such a significant character in those days? Joe Lewis, in my view, in my memory, was a significant character because he was black and had that kind of temperament and attitude that was the exact opposite of the negative stereotype that most whites had about blacks. And the decent people in the media were ready, eager, and willing to prove to the American people the stupidity of bigotry. And he responded with everything that he was to the point where, and it was unique, he became a hero and a model in the United States. It was in a period when you could count on the fingers of one hand among the 500 professional ball players in both leagues the number of blacks. And don't you forget that. It was the beginning of the destruction of the barrier against blacks in the United States in the sports field. 
and the Jews were kept out. Paul Gallico wrote a book saying that the reason that the Jews preponderated in basketball is that they were sneaky and shifty and clever and manipulative. You would believe that a very well-known national sports columnist would write a book and say that and continue until his retirement undisturbed. But he said it. Today, I'm wondering, would a Paul Gallico say that the blacks, who are overwhelmingly beautiful in basketball, and they've made it one of the great sports of our country, are sneaky and manipulative? We've grown up. And Joe Lewis helped open the door, and Jackie Robinson, whom I was proud to call a dear and a because we can't get into Jackie Robinson. That's I just thing. wanted but, to give you one sentence because yeah, I, I loved him and we, I, we I were, know, we were close friends and we traveled you'll together. Never see it again. But, it anyway. but uh, you got it in anyway. <laughs> Max Schmeling, do you remember the fights with Max Schmeling? Joe Lewis? I remember, Max? sure, I remember. There was the a German? German by the name of Max Schmeling who uh, got crucified, if it's the wrong word, by uh, Joe Lewis. I don't remember much more than that. You, so you don't remember what the Jewish community. They came out against it, him, or anything. The Jewish community was not involved th that I knew. First of all, I never, I never went to a football game in my life. I never went to a boxing match. I never read the sport pages, so I'm in a different world. Okay, do you remember the incident with Marty Glickman in the 36 Olympics where the Jew two Jewish runners weren't allowed to? No. Well, what do you know about Avery Brundage? I remember only that Avery Brundage, as head of the uh, International Olympics, uh, saw to it somehow, without taking the blame for it, that blacks and Jews were not very welcome and had a very rough time making it to the Olympics. Cut, oh, I didn't know you were on, I was uh, on camera. Okay. You got it here? Anytime. time. Okay, so tell us about the work of the ADL with regard to both blacks and Jews. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, in which I spent most of my adult life, 50 years of it, was created just 80 years ago, in 1913. By charter, it said, its purpose was to bring together, in greater understanding, the different groups of Americans that went to make up this great country of ours. We recognized at the very outset that the weakest link in the chain of democracy we all had to pay for, as a result of which we were not concerned parochially with Jewish problems, but with all minority problems, with bigotry and prejudice and stereotyping against any victim group to that kind of bigotry. Is that what you wanted? Yeah.